Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to all of you to our debate on protecting and empowering children and young people online. Today's debate is co-hosted by EIF Programming Committee uh, co-chair Ivan Stefanek, MEP with the EPP Group from Slovakia, and by MEP Lise Schreinemacher with the Renew Europe Group from the Netherlands. Thank you both very much for being with us, for taking the initiative and leading this debate uh, on our forum. As you know, today we'll discuss how to make the online world more fit for children and young people. Uh, we'll talk about the legal instruments that are in place or needed in order to ensure that children are protected and empowered in the online world. We will do so with five experts. So we are being joined today by June Lowry Kingston, who's head of unit, accessibility, multilingualism and safer internet and deputy to the director for data at DG Connect European Commission. Welcome. We're also joined by Christopher Payne, who's director of digital responsibility, government and public affairs at the Lego Group. We're joined also by Charlotte Nicholson, director of European affairs at North Vision by Alexandra Evans, Head of Safety Public Policy Europe at TikTok, and Leander Barrington Leach, Head of EU Affairs at Five Rights. Thank you all very much for joining us today. And with no further ado, I'll now leave the floor to our hosting MEPs for their opening remarks. We'll then listen to our speakers' uh, presentations and we will conclude with a Q&A session. Ivan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Maria Rosa. And ladies and gentlemen, really, it's my great pleasure to open today's event, uh, Protecting and Empowering Children and Young People Online, together with my dear colleague, uh, Lige Schreinmacher. The importance of all digital topics in our society is continuously growing, as we know, as well as number of internet users. Nowadays, already 60% of total population worldwide are really active internet users and more and more children are on internet daily. Some studies say that in developed countries even more than 95% of children and teens from 3 to 18 year olds had uh, home internet access and they use it actively. So our world is changing and we build digital infrastructure, we educate digitally and we communicate digitally but the strong growth has also some potential threats. And according to the research EU Kids Online 2020, more than 25% of children recognize some negative experience. And for 7% of them, it was a repeating experience at least once per month. So uh, children protection has been always the priority for our European society. And this topic is connected with our dignity and our existence. Nowadays, when we set up new digital strategies, we definitely have to include there the topic of children protection online. I do believe that we have to align offline and online protection and we have to follow closely all the threats. So new technologies, including artificial intelligence, can help us in this objective, but they must be used wisely and in synergy of all tools. And I believe also that uh, today's topic should be the priority not only for legislators but also for private sector and civic society. There are many activities in the European Parliament currently uh, regarding this topic. For example, our EPP group recently adopted a position paper with the title Rights of the Child and European Commission also, I know, uh, it prepares also a better internet for kids strategy 2022 and also new principles for the industry. I also think it is time to improve children protection online and to implement necessary legislative steps, including obligations for service providers. I'm really extremely happy we can discuss this important topic today and we have great speakers, so I'm looking forward to our today's discussion. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Ivan. And now over to Ligia. Thank you, Maria Rosa. And uh, I would also like to thank the European um, Internet Forum and uh, my colleague Ivan um, uh, for uh, helping uh, organizing this and uh, making it possible. 
Um, I think as Yvonne pointed out, this is a really important topic uh, nowadays. And uh, one out of three internet users is under 18, a number that uh, got even an extra boost during the pandemic and that continues to grow. Um, and as Yvonne pointed out also, uh, the internet offers children the opportunity to follow education, shop, and speak with friends online. And it unlocks information, news, and visual, visual content. Uh, from which children can learn and, and build rich experiences. And um, the opportunities are endless. And I, I do find it very important to, to keep highlighting this, that we should also look at the opportunities. Uh, but I am worried. And uh, obviously we know the internet grew fast and organically in the past decades, but it was never really designed with the child in mind. And the question is, do our children really have sufficient tools and knowledge to navigate the internet in a safe way? And additionally, we have seen worrying developments uh, in which children reported to have been pur purposely exposed to harmful content, including suicidal and sexual content, as well as, for example, tobacco ads. Um, this, this is, of course, very worrisome uh, development. and. Uh, finally, also the data of our children has been abused for commercial practices, including online profiling, without the necessary consent. And this has resulted in a growth of lawsuits, of co court cases against several tech companies. But of course, a lawsuit should be the end, the last resort. It all starts with the right legislation and enforcement. And I believe that we really need to be bold in outlining the way we want the internet for our youngest users to be. And digital liter literacy among children and their parents should be improved. So they know what their choices and their consequences are. And I believe we should also draw clearer lines on what we can and cannot accept in our online environment. And besides asking for an impact assessment and risk mitigation measures for services used by large numbers of children, I believe we should also end the commercial following of users under 18. And with new legislation, such as the Digital Services Act, legislation to counter online sexual abuse, as well as a new European strategy for better internet for kids on the way, we have an opportunity and obligation to fix these issues. So I'm very pleased that we have a panel of experts as well as the Euro Com European Commission here uh, with us today. And I'm very curious to hear how the panelists think about some of these uh, ideas. And I really look forward to uh, the discussion uh, at the end. So thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Lige, and to both uh, you and, and Ivan for setting the scene uh, for this discussion and uh, already highlighting some of the concerns. And as you said, we are now uh, going to give the floor to our panel of, of speakers who are going to bring in different perspectives as well. We will start with uh, June Lowry Clinton at the DigiConnect European Commission. Thank you very much. And thank you, honourable members of the European Parliament, both for organising, sponsoring and inviting me to this very timely debate for us. Um, Commissioner Breton said just last week when he opened the 2021 Safer Internet Forum, a safe, secure and trusted digital space is a cornerstone of the European Digital Society. Children especially should be able to benefit from the unprecedented opportunities of the digital age to become confident, competent and active digital citizens. And at the Commission, we want every child to feel respected, protected and empowered online and offline to enjoy those unprecedented opportunities that were referred to. We know making Europe fit for the digital age was one of the six headline priorities when this college took office. And this spring, the Commission's Digital Compass communication set the direction for digital transformation of Europe by 2030, naming this as Europe's digital decade. As well as ambitious targets, the digital compass will offer a kind of moral compass with a set of digital principles due to be adopted later this year by the Commission, Council and Parliament. And the protection and empowerment of children and young people will be covered by those principles. We may be in this newly dubbed digital decade, but Commission support for children online has existed since the late 90s. 
And in 2012, the, the Commission's European Strategy for a Better Internet for Children, the so-called BIC strategy, Better Internet for Kids, set a global benchmark. And it has shaped and guided national policies and our actions in the Commission ever since. Through our network of safer internet centres and the common portal betterinternetforkids.eu, we have literally reached millions of children, parents and teachers across Europe. And if you don't yet know it, I warmly invite you to check out the portal betterinternetforkids.eu for the wealth of information resources they have there for all ages and in many, many languages. And the strategy and this funding, the actions we fund, have both been complemented by relevant EU legislation, such as specific provisions in the Audiovisual Media Service Services Directive and the General Data Protection Regulation. And other initiatives include the EU strategy for a more effective fight against child sexual abuse, the EU strategy on the rights of victims and the Digital Education Action Plan. Um, as you probably know, the Council and the Parliament are currently discussing two very important Commission proposals relevant in this context. The first ever legal framework on artificial intelligence, which explicitly mentions children's rights, and the Digital Services Act. And last but certainly not least, the Commission's first ever comprehensive strategy on the rights of the child, adopted this March, makes one thing very clear. Children have digital rights too. So that's where we are right now. But there's more to come with a long term proposal about tackling child sexual abuse due still this year and has been mentioned an update of the big strategy due next year. Much of the strategy, in fact, is still relevant. But since 2012, the digital environment, especially for children, has changed dramatically. And in 2019 already, a European Parliament resolution called for an update of this strategy. That update, now underway, will act as the digital arm of the comprehensive rights of the child strategy. And it's now planned for the second quarter of next year, appropriately enough, the year proposed as the year of European youth. As part of that process, this summer, the Safer Internet Centres organised over 70 workshops across Europe, reaching over 750 children, including those in vulnerable situations. And the views gathered will feed both into the digital principles, but also into our big update. And at last week's Safer Internet Forum, we released the results of that consultation. But we also heard live from our big youth panellists. Cyberbullying, inappropriate content, lack of digital skills for all ages, adults and children, curricula not fit for purpose, commercial risks and the use or misuse of their personal data and data traces online were some of the top concerns those young people identified. The Commission is now taking stock of all these findings before we take up the pen and start drafting. And without any spoilers, I think it's safe to say that the new strategy will call on the tech industry to raise their standards towards their youngest users. We need to find effective solutions to well-known problems, such as the spread of online child sexual abuse material and the lack of effective age verification tools. And in this context, I'd really like to thank the European Parliament for their initiative, which led to the EU Consent Pro Pilot Project, which aims to prove that effective pan-European in interoperable age verification and parental consent tools are both possible and practical. The aim of the strategy will be, as Commissioner Breton said, for all of us working together to encourage children to become those confident, competent and active digital citizens that Europe needs and to ensure EU leadership and above all EU values for our children in this digital decade and the digital decades ahead. I thank you for your attention and I'm really looking forward to the discussion afterwards. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, June, for this uh, very comprehensive presentation of the works of the European uh, Commission and, and Parliament as well, uh, starting from the 90s, as you have uh, recalled, and up until today with the new strategy. And as you have mentioned, the institutions will, will call upon the tech industry uh, to help. And uh, we're now going to listen to the views of the Lego Group with Christopher Payne.
Super, thank you very much. And I'm delighted that my head popped up this time. Um, so I just wanted to, to start by saying a big thank you to the European Internet Forum for bringing us together to reflect on a question of key importance. How can we design and shape an online world that simultaneously protects and empowers children? Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I, I look forward to exploring what practical actions can be taken to ensure the EU continues to be a leading voice on this agenda at the international stage. But before that, I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about why this topic is of such great importance to the LEGO Group and concretely what we are doing to usher in a digital future that is fit for children. Most of you will be very familiar with our physical play proposition, the LEGO Brick, but we've been working with digital consumer technology for decades. Today, we offer a range of digital products and services for children of all ages, uh, from connected toys to a broad range of consular games, social apps, and augmented reality experiences. And we are continuing to invest in new technologies in the run-up to our 100-year anniversary in 2032, where we have firmly anchored digital play as a cornerstone of our LEGO brand vision. Why? Well, to be clear, the physical brick will remain at the core of our experience, but we do truly believe in the potential of technology and data to enrich the physical play experience, to stimulate creativity, collaboration, and confidence with more children around the world. Of course, we are acutely aware that technology and data brings with them risks of harm to the child. As a company, we recognize children as vulnerable citizens, and we acknowledge our profound responsibility when engaging with children to protect their rights and to foster their well-being. Luckily, as a company, we have a lot of experience when it comes to embedding safety into the design of our play experiences. Safety has always been a core priority for our physical Lego brick, and this culture of embedding safety as a non-negotiable has transitioned into, our, into the development of our digital products and services. We often use Lego Life, our safe and social app, as an example of safety by design, embedding 100% pre-moderation, random username generators, intuitive and robust verified parental consent mechanisms, just-in-time safety notifications, and so on and so forth. But the truth is our commitment to safety extends beyond our LEGO Life app. It extends to all our digital experiences. And we've been working with UNICEF since 2015 to implement the children's rights and business principles and to develop, it, uh, well, co-create, actually, our child online safety assessment tool. However, it's really important for me to say that the LEGO Group for the LEGO Group, safety is one part of our promise to children, albeit an important one. Our broader mission is to inspire and develop the builders of tomorrow. And of course, we believe strongly in robust safety obligations in, in law and policy in order to do this. But we also want to be able to make sure that the benefits and opportunities from technology are accessible to more children. In our case, through the provision of rich, nurturing and skill building play activities. We want to be able to innovate towards this ambition, but we also recognize the need to ensure that innovation works in children's best interest. So our approach is to ground innovation within a rights and well-being framework, and we're investing a lot in building out what this means in practice. I've already mentioned our relationship with UNICEF to embed rights across the business, but we are working with other partners, other collaborative endeavors uh, across sectoral and around the world to explore how a positive model of innovation embedded in children's rights and well-being can work. One notable example is called the Digital Futures Commission, which under the auspices of Baroness Kidron and Sonia Livingston has brought together cross-sectoral collaboration of companies looking into what good innovation means and how designers can design for it. We're also working on an international research project to better understand what we mean by well-being in the digital era, particularly in relation to children, and how we can begin to measure our impact upon it. And of course, we consider children as a critical partner as well. And I think over the next coming months, we'll have some exciting announcements around how we're bringing them into our decision making and behavior shaping. Now, exposure to technologies, however well thought through and well intentioned, carries a risk. Few, I think, would believe that we can empower children, um, giving them access to the benefits of technology, as well as delivering a zero risk environment. Not that we shouldn't put all of our efforts into minimizing that risk, but that zero risk environment has been highlighted by academics as potentially impeding upon the other rights of a child. But what we can do 
is give children, adults and guardians the tools to manage that controlled risk where we believe the benefits justify it. And that's why we've been working closely with DQI, a Digital Quoting Institute, uh, a world leading think tank on digital citizenship. And last week we announced that the EU Safer Internet Forum, our new extension on digital citizenship program to equip children and families with the knowledge and skills needed to thrive online. So that's the journey that we've been on, to think of design as a series of interconnected priorities that would sit within a rights and wellbeing framework where robust age appropriate safety measures that manage risk play a central role, but they sit alongside and are sensitive to mechanisms that provide access to the benefits of technology for all children. In other words, to protect and empower, not siloed, but working together and sensitive to the relationship between the two. And that's why we're delighted to see the EU prioritizing both of these dimensions, prioritizing children's rights and well-being in upcoming legislation. We're seeing really strong evidence of this in other parts of the world, particularly on the international scene through the UN Children's um, Convention on the Rights of the Child Committee, UNICEF, OECD, Council of Europe, and G20. And I do just want to call out, of course, the Better Internet for Kids strategy, um, which was an exceptionally good piece of work, um, and recognize this balance brilliantly. And we hope the revision will, will carry that on. Um, a couple more practical recommendations. These are a little bit more specific, but specific to the, 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 the Digital Services Act, just want to highlight two quick things. So recital 34 recognizes minors as recipients of intermediary services, and recital 4 uh, states that the DSA's objectives to stimulate innovation in digital services as opposed to hampering them. It's our belief that the DSA represents a unique opportunity to bring these two recitals into articles stipulating the objectives of the DSA in order to stimulate and incentivize investment in a type of innovation that would empower children online. There's some interesting examples of regulatory bodies around the world that have that um, legal obligation, that statutory obligation to support innovation. Secondly, our recommendation is to implement a balanced approach to assessing the adverse impact, taking due consideration of the positive impact of technology on children, Concretely, this could mean turning a risk assessment into an impact assessment, not just at, at looking at the risk and risk mitigation measures, but also looking at the potential benefits and actually the impact of safety uh, mechanisms on other rights of the child. And lastly, we just want to make a call for um, uh, consistency with online safety legislation across the world. I think the EU is definitely uh, an area that is leading in this space. There's great work going on in other locations. And I think being able to drive harmonization of standards where we see best practice across the world is, is critical for businesses to be able to adopt these. So the, D the DSA and the Better Internet for Kids revision represent a huge opportunity to set a blueprint for the future regulation of children and technology. To protect, yes, but also to empower, making the benefits of technology accessible to more children. And I really look forward to the EU institutions taking a lead on this and striking an ambitious approach. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, for your presentation and recommendations and for bringing us up to speed with uh, the online world of the LEGO Group. And of course, uh, very well known for the analog uh, world. And now the two are, are matching. Uh, with safety always at the at the center. We're now going to listen to uh, the views of Charlotte Nicholson with the North Vision. So over to you, Charlotte. Thank you so much, Maria Rosa. And many thanks to the EIF team and uh, also, of course, to our hosting MEPs for introducing this very important subject for today's discussion. This is really at the heart of the ongoing European digital discussion, and I'm very happy to participate on behalf of North Vision um, with comments on how public service media addresses child safety and not least empowerment online. And just a quick note for those of you who don't know North Vision from before, this is the cooperation of the seven Nordic public service media organizations from the Nordic region. So looking backwards a little bit, we have a somewhat strange time behind us. Uh, media, just as society at large, have been thrown into a complex new situation with a lot of new needs for information and content and new ways to engage with audiences. 
And in only a bit over a year, our European societies have taken massive steps into becoming even more digital. Most of this has uh, shown to be very positive, but we can also see how the online democratic debate and information streams are being tested daily and how new areas of safety online needs to be further addressed. And one thing that is very clear um, uh, is the need for trustworthy, independent and easily findable information and content for kids and youth. This has only increased and will very likely continue to do so over the next couple of years. So protecting and empowering children and young audiences online are really at the heart of what public service media companies uh, are doing and part of the way that we are producing content and launch our services. And this is also why it is so important for us to be engaged in the European debate in finding the right approach and balance to the legislations being discussed on these subjects uh, at the moment. And the Nordic public service media uh, companies were quite early out in offering services through our own online platforms and players. The first one was launched already um, 15 years ago. And since then, we have worked hard to innovate and develop our offers to ensure audiences of all ages can find and use our contents in the way that they find most useful. Online child safety is at the core of this work. And to give you an example, um, SVT Kids from Swedish Television is an online video service for 3 to 12 year olds and the service offers content that is fun, entertaining but also educational and it is developed in close cooperation with children to best meet their needs and demands. And very importantly, the youngest children should be able to sit with the application, uh, application themselves without encountering content that is not for them to see. And in addition to this, we also give parents the tool to further add a child lock to adjust content uh, for the different age groups. And the service is very importantly fully separate from the general content offer that we are uh, offering to other age groups. Similar types of dedicated children's services are available, uh, available among all the Nordic public service companies. And for the Danish company, uh, innovation and development of highly qualitative children uh, and youth services, including uh, drama productions, are now being placed at the very top of their newly launched strategy just a couple of days ago. But equally important as safety is also to always put children and youth empowerment uh, on top of the agendas. And this includes working with media and digital literacy to as assist children into making informed choices, to make content and news that is relevant for them and about them. And most importantly, in strong cooperation with them. This is one of the most important parts of, of content production within our companies at the moment, to always bring in kids into the production and launch of new services. But we also work hard to ensure that they feel reflected in all forms of diversity, you know, in what they see and what they hear in our productions. And we are very happy to see how, how a recent report shows that children and, and young people have high confidence in established media and have turned back to them in large numbers to receive news during the pandemic. But in addition to our own platforms and services, we also sometimes use third party platforms for making content available to audiences we are a little bit challenged to reach fully on our own platforms. And this is true also for younger audiences and teenagers. But today we face a situation uh, where platforms largely determine who sees what and when based on, of course, recommendation systems, algorithms and not least their own terms and conditions. And because of this, we have unfortunately experienced a number of several concrete takedowns uh, of our content over the last years on platforms, very often, uh, very often directly linked to children's programs. And a few examples include kids content directed to children as young as the age between three to 10 years and content being taken down largely in accordance with what appears to be platforms own community standards. So what does it mean for children's safety and empowerment of the child online, uh, online? And how can it be justified for global platforms to go beyond limits um, and the area of national legislation? To decide on, on random takedowns of content from a media company with full editorial status and over 50 years of experience in content production for children. 
As much as we, of course, fully agree with the discussion on how illegal offline should be considered illegal online in the European debate at the moment. Reversely, what does it mean when legal media content no longer is considered legal online according to a platform? This is a serious threat to freedom of expression, to media pluralism, and in the longer run, trust for the media. And Norvision, together with the European Broadcasting Union and other media stakeholders, therefore advocates very strongly for a safeguard within the Digital Services Act to prohibit platforms fully for interfering or take additional control of what is considered editorial content. Media companies falls very strictly under national legislation and takes full responsibility for this content and services uh, according to our standards including the very strong responsibility for online safety and empowerment of younger audiences. And in this respect, uh, the Nordic companies and, and the European Broadcasting Union very clearly welcomes the recent votes and discussions we have seen in the CULT Committee, the ITRI Committee um, and the EURI Committee uh, on the DSA around um, safety of editorial standards. And we do hope that this is further reflected in the ongoing discussions in the IMCO Committee as well. So thanks a lot to, um, for bringing this to the table of, uh, of today's discussion and I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to the questions and answers afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Charlotte, for presenting the views of the public uh, service media and for also for opening uh, up and actually closing with uh, uh, the important debate on uh, illegal content. Um, I hope there will be time later during the Q&A to discuss further. We're now going to listen to uh, Alexandra Evans with TikTok. Hi there. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'm sure that many of you do know TikTok, um, but I don't assume we're a new platform that everyone does. So I will start by very briefly introducing us. So TikTok is an entertainment platform, a video sharing um, platform on which users are creating, watching, engaging with a wide variety of short form videos. So videos uh, are typically uh, 15 seconds long, but they can be up to three minutes and everyone is using uh, those seconds very differently. So some to land a joke, some to debut a new song, some to share a recipe, to advocate for change, to support their team or to speak their truth. Um, we are only three years old, but we have been fortunate to see some early success with over 100 million users in Europe at this point. And we take our responsibilities as a company extremely seriously. Our users and our creators come from all communities and um, with ages ranging from 13 up to older generations. And it's really important for me and for all of our colleagues to, to stress that trust and safety is really a central pillar of our work at TikTok. Um, our community has to feel safe in order to um, express themselves. I, I heard um, Chris from Lego talking very much about that, that balance between safety and empowerment. And I think that he's absolutely spot on about that. And that's, again, how we think about it. Safety is critical as a, as a foundational pillar when it comes to empowered self-expression and authentic self-expression. So as I say, TikTok, safety isn't a bolt-on. It's our cornerstone. It's where we start. And this is especially true when it comes to our teenage users. Uh, we've established three really fantastic trust and safety hubs including one in Dublin, um, and these hubs are responsible for driving and developing our global safety strategy. And in addition to addressing issues when they arise, we take an upstream approach and build safety uh, into the design of our services uh, from the very start. So our direct messaging service is a really good example of this. Users can't send an unsolicited message on TikTok, and we also don't allow videos or images to be sent as attachments on our private messaging service. And this was a very deliberate decision that we took on our part to prevent child sexual abuse material from being spread via our messaging service. Um, but of course, adolescence, being a teenager, this is a unique and also really quite precious phase of life. And we get that the teens who are using our platform, they are still learning and they are still growing. And we think really carefully about what additional support they need to use TikTok safely. Um, and then we design our platform accordingly. 
So uh, what does that mean in practice? It means that we are trying to anticipate the vulnerabilities that come with adolescent development in the design of our service. So for example, uh, we don't let under 16s host live streams. Uh, you have to be 18 to send or receive a virtual gift on TikTok. Um, and then we have disabled direct messaging um, entirely for under 16s and then for 16 to 17. So that's those late teens approaching child approaching um, adulthood um, their direct messaging setting is now set to no one by default um, and this year we announced some other pioneering changes to the privacy and safety settings for our under 18 users and some of these include changing the default setting uh, of uh, for, sorry I'm just I'm afraid my own daughter was just calling me and she's in Paris at the moment so um, she's calling quite incessantly so apologies for that um, uh, so this year, as I say, we announced some really pioneering changes to the privacy and safety settings for users for under 18s. Um, and that includes deciding to set the default setting for under 16 accounts um, to private by default. And that was a decision that we took globally and also applied retrospectively to all of our users. We also made the decision to stop push notifications for early teens at 9 p.m. and for late teens at 10 p.m. And that was to support their need for developmental need for, for downtime and for sleep. Um, so, of course, it's really important to think about age appropriate design and to design accordingly against those principles. But it's also critical to understand the age of your users, because with, unless you know the age of your users, age appropriate design um, falls down. So we are absolutely committed to uh, preventing under 13s from accessing our platform and to continuing to enforce our policy on platform by detecting and removing children who aren't old enough to be there. So to help people, um, keep people from using TikTok if they're not old enough to do so, we've designed a neutral industry standard age gate that requires uh, people to fill in their complete date of birth and also um, discouraging people from essentially clicking on a pre-populated minimum age or just sort of doing it on a tick box level. So, and then if someone tells us that they are under 13, then we suspend their ability to create the account and they're essentially ejected from uh, the process with no ability to try again straight away. And then, of course, we understand that our ability, our responsibilities to uh, enforce our age policy don't end at the age gate. Um, and we take a number of additional detection um, approaches to identify and remove suspected underage account holders. So first, we train our safety moderation team to be alert to signs that an account that they are reviewing is potentially being used or controlled by somebody who is under 13. And we also are using information um, provided by our users. So things like, for example, keywords, uh, in-app reports from our community. And that helps us to surface potential underage accounts. Um, and then when our safety team believes an account is likely to belong to someone who's underage, uh, then they uh, suspend the account. Um, as well as working constantly to enhance our age assurance strategy, we are also really committed to being transparent and reporting on progress. Um, so earlier this year, uh, we became, as far as I'm aware, the first major platform to commit to regularly reporting on the impact of our age assurance strategy. Um, and in the first three months of 2021, uh, we removed over 7.2 million suspected underage accounts. And of course, we will continue to work to enhance our age assurance strategy going forwards. Now, I and my colleagues in Brussels are actively following policy initiatives in Brussels, such as the Digital Services Act, the Commission's Child Safety Strategy and the upcoming legislation on child sexual abuse uh, material. Um, TikTok has been really welcoming of the European Commission's um, DSA proposal, and we appreciate the emphasis on transparency as a, as a, as a means to show accountability. Uh, we, for example, have a European Safety Advisory Council with external experts who um, we work with in a very transparent way in order to uh, receive you know, clear and candid advice on our policies and to identify emerging risks. And we've also been leaning into transparency uh, more widely as a company. So, uh, for example, um, we've just opened a Transparency and Accountability Centre in Dublin, where policymakers and experts can have the opportunity to review our moderation practices and app policies and technologies. We also now publish statistics in our transparency report, um, as I mentioned, on the number of underage users. And I think that that is um, a, 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 a precedent that I hope that others will follow. And we are also, again, reporting um, on the number of reports we make to NECMEC, which I think, again, is a really useful um, uh, metric. Um, in addition to this, TikTok is, in effect, continually 
assessing risk on its platform and takes on board advice from all external experts, as I say, especially our European Safety Advisory Council, um, and certainly any potential risks that are associated with usage of our platform by younger users in particular is always front and centre of our minds. Um, I'm conscious that this has been a brief overview and apologies again for the um, for the interruption um, uh, my, from my smartphone. Um, but I'd just like to close by saying that um, we don't ever really see a finish line when it comes to safety. We're always trying to improve and we're really proud that you know, uh, we've become, as I say, taking the opportunity to, uh, to find leadership moments around the decision to make our under 16 accounts private by default, and also to make the disclosures around the number of underage users on our platform. Um, we will continue to listen to feedback from our partners and from those who disagree with our positions, those who want us to go further and faster. Um, and, and of course, we are absolutely committed to um, uh, making sure that our journey is as, 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 as fast as possible in terms of ensuring the safety of our younger users. Um, so thank you again uh, for your time and I'm going to hand back. Thank you very much, Alexandra, for uh, presenting all the various safety measures that uh, such a popular platform like TikTok is uh, putting in place. And uh, I think that is giving you a lot of work, uh, I'm sure. Now, we will uh, bring in our last but not least speaker, Leander Barrington Leach with five rights. Hello, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today and also for the um, really interesting interventions by my fellow speakers so far. Um, our MEP host, they said it at the beginning very, uh, very clearly, pretty much all kids are online today um, and they make up a very substantial chunk of the users of digital services. Um, these kids, well, they're, they're all of them, as I said, there are brothers and sisters, there are own kids, there are grandkids, there are nephews, nieces, um, godkids, whatever. They're, they're all there and offline every day. We Put a lot of effort into to watching over them we protect them from from harm we do our best to empower them to help them to learn and to flourish um, we certainly treat them very differently from how we treat adults because specifically we recognize that as children they do have specific vulnerabilities and specific needs um, but uh, unfortunately this is not the case online uh, where these kids spend a lot an increasing amount um, of time um, online, what we take for granted uh, in the physical world is the exception rather than the rule. Online, the rule is that everyone is equal. In other words, everyone is treated as, treated as adults. Um, the digital world, it's not, it's not optional for children, and yet it's a place where, where their rights have been systematically really overlooked, um, sometimes ignored, uh, undermined, um, dare I say in some cases very much trampled. Uh, so we heard some examples um, before, but uh, I'll, I'll add a few more if I may. Um, children are routinely served up harmful content and not in small doses. So pornography, violence, pro-suicide, pro-anorexia uh, and such. Uh, the impact, it, it's real and it, and it can really be horrific. Just um, for example, I learned recently that 70% of consumers of child sexual abuse material were first exposed to this content when they themselves were children under the age of 18, 40% of them when they were under 13. For example, also children are routinely recommended to and contacted by adult strangers. So did you know, for example, that um, accounts of children as young as 11 have been recommended to groomers on popular social media platforms? Children are also routinely nudged to lower their privacy settings, to spend more time online and to engage in age inappropriate behavior. So did you know, for example, that 80% of the top 50 games rated suitable for children age five and under in the Apple App Store contain in-game in purchases? Um, so at the Five Rights Foundation, we work with children and for children. Our goal is actually very simple. It's to ensure that the digital world is designed or redesigned to reflect, uphold and promote children's existing established rights. So what are these rights? Um, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child 
and the general comment uh, of the UNCRC number 25, which was mentioned previously, they set out these rights very clearly. So there's the right to health, the right to life, of course, the right to privacy, to protection, to information, to education, to play, to participate. Um, and as an overarching principle, the right to having the best interests of the child prioritised in all areas and actions that concern them. The general comment number 25 specifies precisely how these rights should be applied in the digital environment. It prescribes, and I'm only going to give uh, a few examples. Um, so it prescribes that in all actions regarding the provision, regulation, design, management, and use of the digital environment, the best interests of every child must be a primary consideration. That children must be protected from content, contact, conduct, and contract risks. That businesses undertake child rights due diligence, in particular child rights impact assessments that data protection, privacy by design, safety by design, and other regulatory measures ensure that businesses do not target children using techniques designed to prioritize commercial interests over those of the child. And as I say, that's just a few of the prescriptions of General Comment 25. Um, so what does that mean in practical terms for us today? Uh, so firstly, that we need to lay down the norm and here, I make reference to, to horizontal legislation such as the DSA would be good. So lay down the norm and specify that one, a child is anyone under the age of 18. So for example, other speakers um, spoke about uh, the age of 13 uh, for this is, for example, uh, one thing for the age of consent, but children are children until they are 18 and their rights apply until they are 18. That children's rights also apply wherever children are in practice as in across all platforms and services that they use or that impact them, whether they're big or whether they're small, and whether or not they're designed specifically for children. That children have a right to access, so it might be the easiest way sometimes, but we should not just shut them out. We should rather make sure that the experience is age appropriate. That children have a right to high levels of protection by design and default, and in general, that the best interests of the child should be prioritized. So first, lay down the norm. Secondly, we need to set minimum standards. So um, we speak to, to a lot of companies and, uh, and designers, um, and often they really have the, the, um, the best interests of the child in mind, um, and they support that. But time and again, we get the response, oh, I never thought of that. Uh, well, it's the job of the regulator to ensure that designers, that companies, that they know what to think of um, and they know what they will be judged against. So here, a lot of good work has already been done. The IEEE, the Institute for Electrical and Electronic Engineers, has, for example, just approved a draft standard on age appropriate design, which is based on the five works, five rights framework. Um, the age appropriate design code in the UK has set clear standards for children's data protection, bringing about many of those great changes that Alexandra just mentioned. Um, and the EU Consent Project is working to define best practice for age assurance. Uh, June mentioned that. I was very pleased in particular to hear June say also that the updated BIC strategy would have more on standards um, because there's certainly still some way to go in this area. And finally, we need to ensure transparency, oversight and effective proportional enforcement. To conclude, I would just like to reiterate that our digital world is a purpose-built environment. It's shaped through conscious choices, and we need to choose to build a digital world that supports and empowers young people and upholds their rights. For this, children's specific needs must be reflected in the design choices of tech companies, of your companies. Thank you. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you.